Born in Cleveland, raised a hillbilly. What's your story? Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Here's your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. I'm Sarah Blossom Ware. The story I'm going to read today is called More Car Stories. All of our old crappy cars were continually breaking down. We could not usually afford to pay someone to fix them, so Dad did most of that. He did not have any formal training as an auto mechanic, but this was one of the skills he picked up out of necessity. Sometimes the problem was an easy fix, and sometimes it wasn't. I remember lots of clutches going out. If the parts were too expensive or too complicated to replace, it was time for a new vehicle. Flat tires were a very frequent occurrence. The Kuharik family record for flat tires in one day stands at three. Fix a flat was a staple. There were usually several cans rolling around in the trunk of each vehicle at any given time. My parents always bought used tires that were pre-balded but not yet flat, which means that these were the tires that other people felt were too dangerous to drive on the road and got rid of. I actually never witnessed the purchase of a set of brand new tires until after I got married. It seemed like such splurging. I remember one time we were ready to go somewhere when George was about 10 years old. We conducted our usual walk around the car to check for flats and this mission turned up positive. Dad wasn't home, so Mom asked George to change the flat, and he did. We got about halfway to Prairie Grove, and we were driving at a pretty good clip, nearly 40 miles per hour, on the blacktop when all of a sudden we heard a horrible noise like amplified fingernails grinding on a chalkboard. We saw sparks shooting out of the back of the car and saw our new tire bounce over the fence and bound across the cow pasture and out of sight. On another occasion, when Mom was at work at the Washington County Health Department, all of the staff members were startled by a loud boom. When the nurses ran outside to see what had happened, they found that all the windows on Mom's brown station wagon were shattered out. It was a bit terrifying. Who would have done such a thing, and in broad daylight? It turned out that the spare tire in the back of the car had gotten too hot in the Arkansas summer and exploded. My mother drove the car this way to pick up my brother Henry from his baseball game before driving home. What are you going to do? It was my senior year in high school when the brown car years finally subsided. My parents bought me my first car, a 1978 Dodge Aspen. It was white, and it was 1991. After I drove it for a couple of months, one of the headlights went out. A couple of weeks later, I was driving home from Fayetteville after a late shift at KFC, when the other headlight went out. I drove home the remaining 10 miles in the dark using my blinking yellow hazard lights. So I would like to reintroduce our panel discussion members for today's podcast. I have them actually introduce themselves with their six word summaries. Hi, uh, my name is Cynthia Kramer. And I like to describe myself as a mother, bassoonist, and environmentalist. And I'm Laura Valcour, and I am the Energizer Bunny, (laughs) chef instructor, and perpetual student. Hey, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I want to do, before we get into discussion, a segment that I call, So What Have You Been Busy With Lately? So, Laura... What have you been busy with lately? Where do I start? Let's see. Uh, This summer has been pretty amazing with, um, well, mostly the rain because we currently have seven foot high tomato plants in our garden. And we're doing an actual seed to plate program at Benedictine University with our nutrition students. So I will be teaching culinary Um, classes to a pilot program for culinary classes for the nutrition students at Benedictine. And next week, I will be coaching my 9 to 12 year olds for competitions like Food Network's uh, MasterChef Junior and Teen Chopped. And so we're going to be busy in the kitchen. And then I get some time off and I'm traveling with my family first to Vermont, 
uh, where we vacation. But then I have to drive back down to Texas to drop our daughter off for her last year in uh, in Dallas. So we're going to be busy. You're busy. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question about your Food Network training, the kids that you're training. Are they for sure going onto Food Network or are they just are hoping to go someday, but there's nothing kind of set? So what is that training about? It's a competition. So it typically takes about three months of actually going from start to finish through the auditioning for a program like uh, Master Chef Junior or Teen Chopped. So the kids are, are really with me and we're practicing. We're creating um, a variety of dishes because once they're on the TV, they have to do desserts and a main dish and then sometimes they do an appetizer, it varies. But they have to know techniques, they have plating and garnishing. So they're, they're busy. My daughters, my daughters love to watch the Chopped and all of those shows, yeah. Cupcake Wars and and all of those things. So you're training kids for those. It's amazing. Well, they've come to me actually loving cooking. They're very passionate and many of them are very focused even at this young age. So I just help them with their skills and help them to make it faster and give them some um, outlets for creativity, give them some ideas, some techniques that they can use. So, um, and then about the um, the program that you're going to be doing with Benedictine University. So, can you say a little bit about that? Um, more than what you said, um, maybe how many students are in the pilot program? Um, what are your plans after the pilot program with this? Sure. Well, we're hoping that um, this program will create a venue for not just the nutrition students, but for the co for the entire campus. The program is um, a six week um, or six weeks actually, um, once per month. And we're taking, harvesting the vegetables from the garden that we've been growing all summer and then taking it into the, the uh, kitchens at Benedictine. And we have about 120 nutrition students currently at Benedictine in that program. And so each of them will be able to at least take one course. And it will vary in that each program will be taking on a specific theme. And so one of them would be um, sustainability. So one of them would be talking, um, we're actually interviewing farmers who are raising sustainable um, meats. And so they'll be talking to the students in a Skype interview first, and then we go on to cooking products. Yeah, sounds very interesting. Yeah. yeah, we're looking forward to it. We're hoping that it continues and it becomes a prerequisite for oh, okay. for the nutrition program. Well, it sounds very important, like a very important part of um, food education that may be lacking. You'd be surprised the number of not just nutrition students, but college students who really, they don't even know how to boil water. So we thought this would be a great experience for everyone. And make it fun. Oh, it's very fun. Always. Okay, well, thank you for letting us know what you're doing. Um, all right, so let's go on to discussion. I am wondering, what was your first car? How old were you when you got it? You know, how did you come across it? Did your parents buy it? Maybe your relative gave it to you. You earned the money and bought it. Um, first cars are a big deal. I mean, even even as adults, you know, you're going to remember your first car. And mine was, uh, my first car was already an old car when I got it. So it was, but it was a car, you know, it was exciting because it was a car. It was transportation and um, it got me where I wanted to go and, you know, and then some. So I'm um, just wondering, you know, what are your memories about your first car? Okay. Um, so... Uh, my first car was a hand-me-down from my uncle. My uncle is a radiologist at University of Wisconsin. So he always had really fun, cool cars. So the hand-me-down that I got was a fully loaded 89 Buick Park Avenue. So it was <laughs> blue. That's a hand-me-down. And it's, it's a boat. It's a boat. <laughs> and it had... 
it had a digital speedo- like it had numbers for the speedometer and um i mean it was totally awesome and um it, the seats were so cushy i mean it was so we called it the blue marshmallow <laughs> i mean it was really a sweet ride now of course i only drove it to bennett academy which was about 10 minutes away and i had my uniform on which was kind of like a shorter skirt and it had heated seats but the heater and heated seats didn't kick in until i arrived in the (laughs) high school parking lot and i mean that car lasted forever and was everybody loved i got to take it to college um, we well, don't need a limo. You just take. It. You just take it. I, you, know, you my, were the ride. Yeah, it was. It was. It was the best. And um, the other thing was, my dad, since he works at a national lab, he had um, visitors from Russia, and he took them in that car, and they'd never seen anything like it. They're like, it's like an airplane cockpit. You know, they were so <laughs> impressed with this 89 Buick Park Avenue. Oh my goodness. And we loved that car. And then I think it, you know, at, when cars when cars die, it's a sad, sad day. But um, I think in the end, it just cost too much to repair right. it. So we did like, you know, cars for kids or something like that. Okay. But the blue marshmallow, everyone <laughs> loved it. That's an unusual first car. Oh. <laughs> I can't even come close to the oh. blue marshmallow. <laughs> My first car was called the Flintstone Mobile. <laughs> so the Flintstone Mobile was a I don't I can't even remember what year it was, but it was a burgundy Ford and um why it was named the Flintstone Mobile was because it was a four door, and I remember um, there was a huge hole in the back passenger side, and everyone who got in would forget and just put their foot right through to the pavement. Oh. <laughs> so finally, we took car. We tried everything. We took cardboard. We <laughs> took. We tried taping it. We did everything. But I was the. I was 18. This was the first car I had ever bought. I was in charge of driving everyone to and from the games. So I had all, yes, the cheerleaders. I had all of the cheerleaders in the car, um, and we would pack as many people. At that time, seatbelts were not a law, and we would pack as many people as we could into the car and drive, and someone would always get their foot caught in the in the bottom of that car. I remember just watching the pavement as we're as we're scooting along the road, watching the pavement go by. So nobody got hurt. No one ever got hurt. No one ever got hurt in that car, and it got us to so many places. It was amazing, and I paid for it all with my Dairy Queen money that I had been earning since. This is an, a future question, but it's my Dairy Queen job that I'd had since I was, you know. 16. I saved and saved. Good for you. I was proud of it. Yeah. My Flintstone mobile <laughs> memories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, we'll go ahead and let you continue with uh, the next line of questioning, which is what was your first paying job? Um, how did you like it? Who did you work with? Do you still remember characters? I, I worked in fast food too, and I still remember. I will never forget some of the characters I ended up working with and um you know it was it was fun but fast food's a lot of work i'm sure dairy queen was a lot of work too um and then how did you spend the money earned so you know you you bought a car but kind of what what did you do in your free time with your spare money and um, what was your job then like at dairy queen I was cheap labor is what I was. A dollar an hour, I still have my first paycheck stub. (laughs) Wow. But I loved it. It was right across from the school. I would ride my bike to the, it was actually a Dairy Bell is what they called it, but it was real ice cream. It was the true blue. And um, I just remember it was very popular. So I saw all my friends. It was like I was never working because I always saw everyone. But that was another introduction to the culinary world. I just knew I loved being around food, and we would create these poodle cones. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like it, but it's uh, ice cream, and it's shaped with the ears, and you put 
um, cherries for the nose and sprinkles, and it was the <laughs> cutest thing. And I was the master poodle cone maker. I was. So that was my uh, that was my first job. Loved it. Did you get really innovative with innovative with the um, poodle cone process? Or? Not too often. No, <laughs> they were they they were pretty conservative. This group, but uh, no, but we we had fun. We had fun. It sounds <laughs> just. It sounds great. I think working with ice cream is a great first job. Yeah, exactly. I do. <laughs> Took some practice because those machines, you know, you have to control the ice cream flow. So, you know, some of those poodles didn't come out looking like poodles. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do then with your free time when you were I was a pretty active there? kid, you know. I was, um, we had a lot of activities in the neighborhood, the pools and um we had, I remember Foursquare being huge, and we would go to the the local gym and have tournaments and things like that. But really, I was just a kid riding my bike, you know, going to the pool, going to the library, just hanging out. That sounds great. I think Foursquare is still a thing. Is it a my, thing? My kids talk about Foursquare at school huh. on the playground. How about yeah. that? <laughs> I, I remember Foursquare. I could not play softball. It was terrible. <laughs> Kickball, I was pretty good. Dodgeball. Dodgeball. You're good. <laughs> I'm good at dodging. <laughs> Everyone has their strengths. <laughs> oh, and how about you, Cynthia? What would you... Okay, so I took a while to get my first paying job. Um, I didn't work in high school. Um, I was really college focused and I had a lot of extracurriculars. I was in band. I was playing bassoon in an orchestra downtown Chicago. So I just didn't have, let's say, a, a lot of time to have, let's say, a fast food job. But um, when I was in college, I saw that there was an internship uh, opportunity at the National Lab where my dad worked. And I thought, awesome, we can carpool to work in the Blue Marshmallow. And so <laughs> so I applied for it and I got it. I mean, I was, I was real excited. It was for in the environmental science department. Uh, my major was um, science business. So it was a major in environmental science and a minor in business. But I'd taken all the environmental science courses. And um, we, I ran soil samples to look for hyphate content because we're looking for the carbon sequestration, like how prairies could pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And so this is back in 2000, so um, a little bit pre before um, Al Gore and sustainability and everything being so popular. But, you know, the, the government was funding this type of research because they're trying to figure out how can we get these greenhouse gases out of an environment. So it was very important work. Um, it was very solidary work. So or, you know, you're all by yourself. It's you in the dirt. And if you mess something, and then these samples were from like 1988. So there was only a finite amount of, cause I was doing, cause it was doing like now and then, you know, 2000 to see how it had changed over time. Um, you know, and it's it's a kind of a lot of responsibility. You're right. And I, I did mess one up and I was, you know, just mortified, but everyone there was laid back. And it was the environmental science department. So everyone was vegetarian. They were all Democrats. They were all like Sox fans. It was really, it was an interesting experience. And um, they were more cultured than me. I'd always had the same type of food and so they would take me out to like an in they took me out to my first indian restaurant and i was like crying because the food was so <laughs> spicy and i like didn't know what i was eating but um i it was a great experience now at the time when i had that job i was like i can't work by myself like this i, I need something different so i ended up going into sales because i wanted to be with people all the time um but now I'm back in academia as a librarian, kind of like a hybrid. So I'm with people, but I'm still in that academic focus. But it does kind of appeal to, you know, my goal of sustainability and coming up with solutions to help with the environment. And all the money I earned 
went to my college tuition. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. But I, but I, I, uh, I, I went to Notre Dame, and I had a wonderful experience there. So it was well worth it. Yeah, that's a super cool first job. I mean, I'm a scientist, yeah. but you know, that's well, yeah, it really <laughs> gets you right in. Yes, it does. Yeah, neat. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, all right. So I'm going to bring back a question that I like to bring back when we change panel discussion members because I like the answers that come out of this question. So this is a recycle question, um, but it's from a previous podcast, previous chapter. Um, so my mom never knew the story of why my brothers came home barefooted with my dad after going for a walk in the woods. Um, she never could get it out of any of them, why they didn't have any shoes on. And only very recently, you know, about five years ago or less, my dad finally told her the whole story, the, you know, what happened. So was there something from your childhood that maybe you didn't know the whole story of until much later? No. Laura? Oh boy, this is going to be a bit of a, a, a good one. Um, I found out I have a brother. Uh, wow, this was that's interesting. a big one. That's a big this one. Is, yes. <laughs> Actually, you are not the first person <laughs> to say something like this for an answer, believe it or not. Really? Yeah, really. But oh, yeah, please continue. <laughs> so I was visiting and... Um, I'm not going to name my age, but I was very curious and I kept um, asking my father these questions and he never really gave me a direct answer, but I never really quite understood why this person was around. He wasn't related to anyone, <laughs> but he was always there and um, everyone was cordial and it turned out that in fact, my father, well, I had a brother, I had a half brother and the way that it came out finally was my grandmother, uh, who had been raising him as her son. And it turned out he was not her son, was he? But um, this young man was just very pleasant, and uh, he dealt with it all very, very well. And so I'm still learning a lot of stories as we have our, we call it a cousin palooza. Um, we have another one. We have another one coming up in August, and we hear lots of interesting stories from all of our extended family. But uh, yeah, this was the one that kind of threw me over. And, um, and how I have old to were say, you when you found out the mm, true story? I mean, how many years ago, maybe? How Let's many put years it that ago? way? About twenty years ago, okay. I found out. Yeah, about twenty years ago. So he was pretty sheltered for a while and uh, families didn't have the reunions as frequently as we do now but um now this, there's new stories that come out that are that are funny and um we don't we're not in touch with him as as much as we'd like to be but i think everyone has kind of just you know come to terms with it and we we talk about the funny stories now and so maybe you said it and i missed it but what was this from a time when he was very, very young before he married your mother? Well, I'll be quite honest. I'm not quite sure okay. where that came into play. Those details are a little <laughs> those fuzzy. Those details are still fuzzy. Those are, yes, those are still a bit fuzzy. Okay. But wow. uh, yeah, yeah, that's a big one. That <laughs> kind of shocked me. I had a friend that had a similar experience. Interesting. Yeah. I had a friend that had a similar experience. Um, her, she had graduated, she was married, had children, and uh, her mom went to see a mysterious person, you know, <laughs> went to see this mysterious person in another state. And later on, she came out and she said, well, you have a half sister. I had to give her up for adoption, but after she turned 18, you know, she had my contact information and wanted to meet. And so they met, but it was, it was awkward, right? Because you look like family, <laughs> but let's say you're raised in the South and they're raised in the North. So they have a funny accent 
and you have things in common, but you don't because you haven't spent your whole life together. So, um, but that's that's my friend's story. Mm-hmm. That's that's not mine. My story. So, what's your story? My story <laughs> is kind of nowhere near that story. So, <laughs> but it's tied to the station wagon from previous podcasts. So, one Halloween we were um, trick or treating. But it was pretty bad. My mom would take the tailgate out and she would let us like hang her legs or whatever. And so we're tailgating and this guy comes after us in a Jason mask and a machete. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Terrified. Real machete. Real machete. Okay. I was, my sister claims that I flew from that back to the front seat. And my mom, you know, she was ready to run over the guy with our car. Yeah. And then, scary. you know, and, you know, I was just terrified. That was just, a, that, that was just an event. It happened. I, it was, you know, mythological in a sense. And then years later, I find out, oh, it was our neighbor. Our neighbor was dressed up and thought it'd be fun to come after us with the machine. <laughs> wow. I, so I, your neighbor is lucky your mom didn't run him over. I, right. Yes. No, I, I mean... <laughs> We have a neighbor who does that. Okay. So, again, gets dressed in camouflage and waits for the kids to come trick-or-treating and then jumps out <laughs> and scares the bejesus. They all scatter. With a real machete? Well, no, not with a real machete. <laughs> <I'm not yet. laughs> That's a little extreme. I, I was scared. <laughs> I wasn't the only one. So then you belted him with your f- no, my mom sped away. Like she decided not to run him over and just uh-huh. drove away. But we had the tailgate. You know, we were going slow with the tailgate open. You know, with our feet out. You know, <laughs> and you know this man. Well, what I that? do know him. Yeah, yeah. Did no, you ever he's say? still a neighbor. Um, <laughs> he's still a neighbor. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> They'll keep him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know. I think there was some discussion, but they're they're okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much for all of your um, interesting stories. You said you got you, great responses. Oh, there. yeah. I like. I love that question. It's, it'll be back with the next panel for sure. <laughs> um, so um, let's, I guess, we'll wrap it up. And any final comments that you guys um, have for today, then let's hear them. Watch out for those neighbors. Yeah, watch out for your neighbors. <laughs> you know. And there's always more to the story. Right? This is true. There's always, always more to the story. I think that's the... <laughs> and then you never know when you'll find out more. It could be years later right. when you find out more. Yeah. So so okay. keep your eyes wide open. Why? Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you once again. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Tune in next time to hear about my very unique, larger-than-life character, my granny. Until then, dream big and have fun. Mm -hmm.